<laughs> well, I was waiting for my son to get old enough to ask me this question. Why do bad things happen? That's a good question. So I ask myself this all the time. Why do bad things happen? Because um, they do. It is what it is. I believe in whatever seed you put in, that's what you want to be now. Maybe that's what I would ask God, honestly. Can't fathom the idea of a devil. It just seems so harsh. Bad things just happen. I mean, you can watch an insect on the ground and one gets stepped on and one doesn't. Why do bad, because you think negative and then you speak it into existence and then it happens. Bad things happen because of probability. Random numbers. I don't think there's a reason for them to happen. There has to be a balance for everything, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Life's like, it's like irrational, you know. I can't tell you that. Bad things happen because people choose to do bad times. I don't know why bad things happen. Put it on my list to ask God. I think it's just something about life. You have to have bad times to understand the good ones. So I think it's just like a cycle. The guy I know, Bruce, came on Alpha. He was very intelligent and also very skeptical. And he was an atheist and nothing convinced him otherwise until the talk, how can I resist evil? And at the end, he said, I'm a lawyer. And in my practice as a lawyer, I see so much evil. I've always believed in the power of evil. But now I realize that if there's a power of evil, it's only logical to believe in a power of good. Some people find it very easy to believe in evil and the devil. William Peter Blatty, who wrote the screenplay for The Exorcist, said this. As far as God goes, I'm a non-believer, but when it comes to the devil, well, that's something else. The devil keeps advertising. The devil does lots of commercials. Yeah, the Apostle Paul speaks about spiritual forces of evil that are at work in the world today. And the claim in the New Testament is that just as behind good is God himself, so behind evil is the devil. Now, that might sound a bit far-fetched, but for some, it's easier to believe in the devil than it is to believe in God. I was an atheist. I had great difficulty believing that God could exist. I became a Christian. I came to believe in God. But then somebody said to me that there's a devil. And I thought, come on, it's hard enough to believe there's a God, let alone to believe that there's a devil. Part of the problem is that I had a false image of God and of the devil. I had a picture of God as an old man with a beard sitting on a cloud. Similarly, I had a false image of the devil. I thought of the devil with horns, a tail, cloven hooves, and a pitchfork. Of course, those images of God and of the devil are not only unbelievable, they're also unbiblical. The New Testament talks about a, a triple alliance, like the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world's the enemy around us. It's all the evil that's around us, the world that's turned away from God. The flesh is the enemy within us. The flesh is not the body, there's nothing evil about the body, it's the evil desires that come from within each of us. And the devil is the enemy above. Jesus clearly believed in the existence of the devil. He taught his disciples to pray, deliver us from the evil one. Jesus himself was tempted by the devil. So, scripture talks about the existence of the devil. Also tradition, Christians down the ages have always believed in spiritual forces of evil. And you may have had this experience, particularly if you've had a powerful experience of the Holy Spirit. You suddenly find that there seem to be all kinds of things coming against you, temptations that you weren't really aware of before. There's also common sense. How do we explain so much evil in the world? We live in a world where, where terrible things happen. Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire was part of the UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda and he witnessed the genocide there in 1994. Because he had only a small number of officers, he was unable to stop it. Afterwards, he wrote a book and he called it Shake Hands with the Devil. He wrote this, I know that there's a God because in Rwanda I shook hands with the devil. I've seen him, I've smelled him, I've touched him. I know the devil exists and therefore I know that there's a God. There are two equal and opposite dangers when we think about evil. One danger is complete disbelief, and the other is an unhealthy and excessive interest in the powers and the practices of evil. Things like Ouija boards, tarot cards, horoscopes, palm reading, that kind of thing. People who are on a spiritual search often experiment with these kind of things. 
It's not the unforgivable sin, but if you do it, then turn from it, repent from it, get rid of any books or anything in your life associated with it, because we're not supposed to have an unhealthy interest with these things. Yeah, the devil wants to destroy our lives. Jesus described the devil as a thief who wants to rob us. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That is his ultimate aim. It's the complete opposite of what Jesus wants for your life. Jesus loves you. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. That's what God wants for you, fullness of life. The devil's aim is to destroy and he uses clever tactics. It's never obvious at the start where he's trying to take you. I was accused of murder when I was 15. At 16 year old, I eventually went to jail and I went to a detention centre called Medhamsley. It was very, very harsh. In that place, I was told what to do and I wouldn't do it. I was anti-authority. I had, I had a lot of physical beatings in there. I was put in solitary confinement a lot and, and it didn't help me. I just thought these people were bullies. So when I got out of there, I was more angry than when I went in. I was an embarrassment to my mother. She said, you know what? She said, you're the son of Satan. You're evil. She said, you're worse than your father ever was. Now that was bad to me because my dad was very violent to my mum, often raped her. So for me, for her to say I was worse than my dad, who was the son of Satan, it just got me really angry. And so my next step was to become a football hooligan. I started getting slashed, I got cut up across my face, I had my little finger chopped off. I was stabbed four times in the arm and chest. I've had a bottle in both eyes, I've got no front teeth. I had both my shoulders, my arms pulled out my sockets. It was anarchy. I loved to fight the things I did, which I couldn't mention, really. But I did some very, very, very seriously evil things. I was evil. I was sheer evil. The devil wants to lead us on a path to destruction. So what are the devil's tactics? Well, the first is doubt. All of the important things in life require faith, and therefore they're open to doubt. The devil wants us to doubt our beliefs and believe our doubts. But God wants us to doubt our doubts and believe our beliefs. The devil lies and causes us to doubt who we are and who God is. Jesus describes the devil as a liar and the father of lies. In the Garden of Eden, in the opening chapters of Genesis, which is really an expose of how evil works, the devil is described in terms of a serpent whose opening line to humanity is, did God really say? He casts doubt on what God has said. We see that really clearly with Jesus. At his baptism in the River Jordan, the words of the Father come from heaven. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. And immediately afterwards, Jesus is led out into the desert and the devil comes to him. And his opening line is, if you are the son of God. In other words, the devil tries to make Jesus doubt his identity. The devil will try to get you to doubt God's goodness, to persuade you that God is a spoil sport who just wants to ruin all your fun. He lies about God's identity and about yours. And if he can get you to doubt your identity as a Christian, as a child of God, then he will. Yeah, many of us struggle with self-doubt. It lies about ourselves that other people have told us and we've ended up believing about ourselves. But our true identity is that we are children of God, deeply loved by our Heavenly Father and created in his image for a unique purpose. Another tactic of the devil is temptation. And all of us experience temptation to some degree. My greatest temptation. Well, uh-huh. Barbecue. First thing that came to my mind was food. Mac and cheese. Pickles. I'm from the South and, you know, barbecue and fish, you know, we can't go wrong. Oh, man. Women. <laughs> Sweet tea. I could go on. Oh my god, please don't do this. Um, immature boys. Weed. Sex. I feel like probably... <laughs> Just boys. <laughs> Just boys. Weed. <laughs> oh god, women. That's easy. That's really easy. Cursing? Sometimes we just road rage. Mm, milk and cookies. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being tempted. Everybody's tempted. 
You can't go through life without experiencing temptation. Jesus was tempted in every way, just like us, except he was without sin. So it's important to make the distinction between temptation and sin. The New Testament makes it clear that it's the devil who tempts us, not God. So in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, Satan is described as the tempter. Occasionally we have a thought that comes into our minds and we think, where did that come from? That's not sin. It's only sin if we adopt it and act on it. But the devil makes us think that we've already messed up and now it doesn't matter what you do because you've already fallen. Then there's a tactic of deception. All sin is a form of deception. Again, in Genesis, where the devil, in the form of a serpent, says, you will not surely die if you disobey God. In other words, it's not going to do you any harm. But the devil tries to deceive us into thinking that God doesn't love us or want us to have the best in life. Jesus wants you to have life in all its fullness. He loves you. He doesn't want you to experience evil. He wants you to experience good. Yeah, and one of the other titles of the devil is the accuser. He makes us doubt God's goodness and love. He tempts us to break God's commands, which are there for our own protection. And then he accuses and condemns us. There's a big difference between conviction and condemnation. Conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. It's when we know exactly what we've done is wrong and we turn away from it and receive forgiveness. But condemnation is from the devil. Condemnation is when we just feel really bad about ourselves. But the New Testament tells us there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. On the cross, Jesus took the condemnation that we deserve upon himself so that we don't have to. Our position in the battle has changed. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son he loves. In other words, you were in the dominion of darkness, where you could say, in a sense, the devil was in control. But through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, the moment you invite Jesus to come and be part of your life, he transfers you from the dominion of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus, where Jesus is in control and there is total freedom. By 1995, I was a tramp and I didn't realize this then. The inside of my body was shutting down, so all I did was drink, take drugs, didn't eat. I didn't realize I was getting septicemia. I had malnutrition and dehydration. In March of 1996, some people turned up on the street and they said to me, do you know Jesus loves you? And I chased them. Jesus, my nana sang about Jesus when I was a kid. There was no such thing a week after they came back. And I seen these Christian men and women on the street for the next six months. One morning I woke up, it was just a normal day. I got my drink and my drugs and I collapsed. I was rushed to the hospital. I was in a coma for six days. My mother was asked to come to the hospital. She went to the hospital. I was dead. I'd had my last rites on the sixth day. The consultant said to my mum, there's nothing I can do. So she said, can I have a few more hours to think about it? So my mum went out of the room and there was a lot of people there come to say goodbye to me. And then Tony, my mate, said to my mum, there's some Christian lads here. And my mum went, well, what good is that going to do? How can that help him? He's dead. And they said, well, let us pray for him. So they went and prayed for me and they put their hands on my head and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, give this man new life. And I woke up, sat up, pulled the mask out my mouth. I was alive, come back to life. But it wasn't just a miraculous waking up of the coma. I woke up totally different. I knew I'd never drink again or take drugs or smoke. I wanted to help people. I actually thought I'd gone insane, to be honest. And these Christian men said to me, do you know what, Graham, you need to go on an alpha course? So I said, what's one of them? We went on the day away. So on the third talk on the afternoon, and I stood up and I said, Jesus, this is the exact words, I've never forgot it. It was November the 9th, 1996, a quarter to three. And I said, Jesus, and I, I've been told you love me, and I kind of believe that you love me but it's not enough. I need to know something in my heart. And as I said that, and I said, sorry, will you come into my life? I fell back into my chair and I was crying. I, I couldn't stop. 
At that moment as them tears flooded out my eyes, I knew where I was from, I knew who I was, and I knew what I had to do. So that night at 10 o'clock, I went back to the streets of Middlesbrough, full of Jesus, and I began my ministry. That was 19 years ago. And ever since then, that's what I've done. I've gone, I've told people about Jesus, I've run 141 Alpha courses. There's a couple of things I say to people on the streets or in the prison when I first meet them, because they're full of doubt, you know, I was doubtful. And I say, well, Graham, how do you really know that, you know, you didn't just wake up out of a coma? Now, maybe I did just come out of that coma by coincidence, but I often say, for the last 19 years, why have I lived how I have? You know, where did the violence go? Where did the anger and the rejection and not knowing about love, where did that go in one night? Jesus is supreme love, that's what changes, that's what changed Graham Seed. So if it changed Graham Seed, it does for anyone. So if we experience this transformation, then why do we still struggle with temptation? And why do we still struggle with evil? The decisive moment of the Second World War was D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. At dawn, thousands of Allied troops began to pour onto these beaches under heavy enemy fire. Though many lives were lost, it was the great breakthrough. Essentially, it was the day the war was won. At the death and resurrection of Jesus, the ultimate victory was won. That was the decisive moment. And the moment you invited Jesus into your life, if you did that, the power of sin was broken. But the war didn't end there. There was a whole period of months of the mopping up operations until VE Day, victory in Europe, on the 8th of May, 1945. In a sense, right now, we live between D-Day and VE Day. The victory has been won, but we're still in this period of the mopping up operations, which will only be complete once Jesus returns and when we get to meet him. And if your experience is anything like mine, when I first encountered Jesus, then a lot changed in my life. But there are other times that I struggle with things, and if I'm honest, I still struggle with them today. One time, a few months ago, I was uh, biking along Oxford Street, and um, uh, I was a little bit away from the pavement, because uh, I like to bike a little bit away from the pavement for various reasons. And there was a black cab. Do you know the taxi drivers in London, the black cabs? There was a black cab behind me who was getting really impatient, and he started hooting on his horn. And then he came right past me, because he thought I was holding him up. He came right past me, really close. And he shot past me, and as he went past, he shouted at me, you're in the way, move over. And something in my spirit, <laughs> I don't think it was the Holy Spirit, <laughs> said, get him. <laughs> so, the great thing about a bike is you, that the, the cars do have to stop at traffic lights. So he got caught at the traffic light and I managed to catch him up. And uh, as I got to alongside, he said, you sh you're, you're in the way, you should move over. I said, what's your number? Because I know they don't like being reported. I said, what's your number? At that moment, the light changed to green. He said, my number, and he drove off. And I thought, right, I am going to get him. <laughs> so I started biking after him. And I was looking at, I was trying to learn his number, 58815. I'm going to report him, 58815. And I could see he was looking in his rear view mirror, trying to see what I, who, what I was doing. And uh, I managed to catch up, and I got alongside him, and he said, Nicky, you should keep to the rules. I thought, did I hear that correctly? <laughs> he said, Nicky, you should keep to the rules. The next thing I knew, 
he was leaning out of his window, shaking his Alpha Manual <laughs> like this. <laughs> so I went up to him and I said, have you done the Alpha course? <laughs> He said, yes, I became a Christian on Alpha two months ago. <laughs> so he hadn't had much time for sanctification. <laughs> I said, oh, what's your name? <laughs> he said, my name's Dean. I said, so nice to meet you. <laughs> I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> By this time, he was a mixture of anger and so quite interested to meet the person who he'd been watching on DVD for the last 10 weeks. <laughs> the passenger in the back of the cab was totally mystified. <laughs> so eventually he turned around and he said, this guy runs the Alpha course. It's inspirational. It's changed my life. And as I bite off, I thought, I really have got a long way to go. <laughs> We're still in a battle. It's a process, and it won't be complete until Jesus returns. So what's our defense? How do we fight this battle? Well, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 that to fight this battle, we have to be strong in the Lord. We have to put on the full armor of God. So effectively, the Bible is saying that we have to get rid of the bad habits and replace them with good ones. Stay close to Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus with the belt of truth around your waist. Jesus said, I am the truth. This is the opposite of hypocrisy. It's authenticity, integrity, openness in your life. The breastplate of righteousness. Keep your relationships right. Keep short accounts. If you mess up, as we all do, ask God to forgive you and pick yourself up quickly. And the same with other people. If you fall out with someone else, deal with it quickly. Ask for forgiveness, get it sorted out. Get involved in service, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Don't just sit around doing nothing. Get involved, serve at church or in your community. Trust God in difficult times. Paul says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. The devil's going to throw stuff at you, doubt, fears, anxieties, lust, all kinds of things. Keep on trusting, don't give up your faith. Put on the helmet of salvation. Win the battle of the mind. Salvation means freedom, the freedom which Jesus brings. All these temptations tend to start in the mind. A thought becomes an action, an action becomes a habit, a habit becomes a destiny. Know your Bible. Soak yourself in the Word of God. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I really encourage you to get to know this book, to read it daily if you can. Use a hard copy, download the Bible in one year app, whatever works for you. Each time Jesus was tempted, he replied with a verse from the Bible. He knew the scriptures well, and he used it as a defense against the attacks of the enemy. Keep praying. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. Keep close to God through prayer. And lastly, stand firm together. There is no armour for the back. We're most vulnerable when we're running away, but far stronger when we stand together. The good news is you can do it. James says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. We can overcome evil with good. That's how we attack. And one of the ways that we can do that is through forgiveness. In the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples, known as the Lord's Prayer, he tells them to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Uh, forgiving someone is one of the hardest things that we can do, but there is such power in forgiveness. My name is Barty Emanuel and I participated in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I murdered many Tutsi under the order of bad leadership and have spent six years in prison and four years in community service. While in prison, fellow prisoners invited me to try Alpha. 
I went but struggled to engage. I realized I needed to tell the truth about what I had done and wrote a letter asking for forgiveness of the relatives of those I had murdered. Life was so hard after being released from prison. I found my wife with two children that were not mine and I faced many heartbreaking situations. I didn't know how I was going to live with the genocide survivors after what I had done. My heart was filled with agony, loneliness and fear. Encouraged by Alpha in prison, I decided to do Alpha again. I learned that Jesus forgives and experienced love in a way I had never known before. With the help of a local pastor, I went to find Vincent, whose mother and grandmother I had killed, to ask for forgiveness. I now live in a village built for genocide survivors and perpetrators. Vincent lives in the same village. We have formed a friendship and I now experience peace like I haven't experienced it before. Day-to-day -day life continues to be a challenge, but I have found forgiveness and healing for the things that I have done. Paul writes, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Don't just go through life saying, I didn't do anyone any harm. That's not a great ambition. How about doing some good? There is so much injustice in our world and so much that can happen when we fight evil with good, when we fight against injustice. Look at what other people have done in the past, inspired by the example of Jesus. Look how Shaftesbury changed the whole social condition of his nation in the 19th century. Look at Wilberforce, how he led the campaign to abolish slavery. Look at Martin Luther King Jr. and how he fought to bring an end to the segregation between black and white in North America. Look at Mother Teresa, who transformed so many lives by giving herself wholeheartedly to the service of the poor. This is not just for the great heroes of history. This is for you. Your life can make a real difference. Your life has a purpose. You can leave a legacy of transformed lives. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In Jesus' name.